We need history more than money. Ladies and gentlemen, we need leaders who are more interested in people than in private ambition. If you're going to transform something, you have to engage it. You cannot change what you avoid. Welcome to Leading Edge Leadership with Dr. Miles Monroe. Discover the leader in you and others. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Miles Monroe and welcome to a special series of sessions on leadership called Leading Edge Leadership with Dr. Miles Monroe. On this program, we'll be focusing on discovering the leader within you and in others. I believe that you were born to be a leader, but most people will die as followers. And that's because they've never been challenged to tap into the hidden leader trapped within them. I believe that every follower has a leader on the inside and our environment, our culture, and of course our con conventional thinking does not allow the leader to be merged. I want to remi remind you that you were born to be something important in the world. So three things you must remember. Number one, Jesus Christ and God himself created you to be a leader in your generation. Two, you were not born to be a leader over people, but over a gift. And number three, that you were born to make a difference and not just to make a living. This program will help you discover the truth about yourself and the truth about your gifts and how important it is for you to discover that you were born to make an impact in the world. So as we begin this journey, I trust that you will sit back, get a notebook, a notepad, and listen carefully to every single session as we study leadership together and discover the leadership trap within you. So join us again now right here on Leading Edge Leadership as we enter the session to study leadership. I want to talk to you about uh, the 10, sorry, the 12 principles of leadership. I'm going to give you them very quickly. And then for the next uh, few sessions that I have, I'm going to deal with them personally. So write this down, please. Everyone take notes. You want to focus for the next few minutes on the 12 principles for developing your personal leadership. What did I say? 12 principles for developing personal leadership. I want you to focus on the word principles for a minute because the word principle actually is important. A principle is a law. It's a law. And it's a law that affects function. Principles are not facts. Facts change. You don't want to live your life by facts or according to the facts of life. Don't do that. Facts are unpredictable. They always change. Principles are constant. These are laws, uh, sometimes we call them precepts, that are created or inherent in creation or that are built into life that if you follow them, you will guarantee success. So the facts don't do that. Principles guarantee success. So I'm going to teach you principles of developing yourself into a leader. Now a principle means that it's a law, which means that it works everywhere, it works for anyone, and it works anytime, in every situation. That's the power of a principle. A principle has no respect for anybody. You gotta respect the principles. So if you learn principles, you become wiser than people who know facts. Plus, principles give you the power to always know what to do. They simplify life. So principles are critical. So what I'm gonna share with you then is these 12 principles that I have discovered, learned, applied, and also researched in the lives of people who were effective in influencing the world. I live by them myself, and that's probably why my influence is becoming broader daily. These principles work for anyone and everyone, which means that really anyone can become a leader. I know this sounds almost impossible, but God's plan was never for anyone to be a follower. We became followers because we lost our leadership spirit when we declared independence from the source of leadership, which is God himself. And we are therefore victims of our context 
and our cultures. And my hope is that I can set you free from your culture, which I was a part of myself. I mean, I was a prisoner of the culture in which I was born, and that culture does not develop leaders. That culture encourages servitude. And I think all of you in this room are suffering from that culture and those watching this television program, all of us, because we are born in a culture that does not believe in us. And that's a fact. The culture we were born into are designed to make you an employee, to make you dependent, and to guarantee that all you will ever have in life is a job. That's the culture we are in. All of our systems and education and our training and even our upbringing is designed to maintain that environment that you behave yourself. As a matter of fact, one of the common statements I heard growing up was this, know your place. Uh, that's a serious statement, but what that really means is there are some boundaries you ain't supposed to cross, there's some areas you ain't supposed to leave, there are some restrictions you're supposed to live with for the rest of your life, and you are a victim of what we say you can and cannot do. This is the environment we were born into. This is debilitating, it is oppressive, and we even have accepted it as life, which to me is tragic, because we have surrendered to what I call the context. This is my lot, we say. This is what I have to deal with. This is what I have to put up with. And so we end up surrendering to the culture and the culture designed to bury us before we die. Most of us are actually already buried. We're buried in a culture that has completely devalued us. Now, what I'm hoping to do is to set you free from that culture which really created your mentality. And of course, your mentality becomes your own prison. And what I try to do is to break into your mentality and change your ideas. You are simply the manifestation of your own ideas. That's what you are. And until you change your ideas, you will never change your life. So what I do is I introduce, I don't want to use the term new ideas, I introduce the original ideas that you lost back to you. I want to begin this segment then talking a little bit about leadership motive, because this is the context we're dealing with. First of all, write this down. True leadership must lead to change, and that change translates into social betterment. Anyone who says that they are a leader must focus on changing their environment, their context. You cannot be a leader and everything remains the same. If you claim to be a leader and nothing is changing around you or you are not changing anything, you are simply a manager, not a leader. That leads to point number two. True leadership should not and must not support any vision or process that perpetuates or gives con continuance to social injustice. A leader will never imprison people and oppress people. Leaders set people free. True leaders deliver people from the inhibitors of life. They help people discover that there is no limit to what they can do or become. Any leader that does not introduce that kind of life to you is not a leader, that's a dictator. That leads to point number three. True leadership is always committed to the essence of life. In other words, a leader believes in the noble values of life. They believe you should rise to the higher calling on behalf of other people. They never destroy people. They heal people. They never oppress people. They release people. If you want to become a leader, you have to become a servant of humanity. If you claim that you want to be a leader in your generation, you're going to have to find a vision and a cause that improves other people's lives, not your bottom line or your pocketbook. So most of the people that we call leaders, we need to 
measure them against these three principles. And these are principles. The first one, leaders are interested in the betterment of other people. Number two, they are against injustice. And number three, they always work on the behalf of humans. They help humans grow, expand, achieve greatness. This is the spirit of true leadership. Now, I want to give you what I call the seven lessons of leadership. And I mentioned these in the last session. I want to just reiterate them. Uh, those who are going to lead in the future are going to have to have these seven attitudes. Number one, they must understand that leaders don't wait. And this is an important statement. A leader doesn't wait for things to happen. They make things happen. Leaders don't wait for someone else to do something. They decide to do it themselves. Leaders don't pray for change. Leaders initiate change. So you can always tell a leader, when a leader is present, they act on things. They don't wait for instructions. They literally instruct. And the first person they instruct is themselves. Someone has to do something about this. That's how leaders talk. Someone has to change this. You know, when you think of people like Mr. Nelson Mandela, who was born in a country that was under apartheid for over 70 years. I mean, there were many black leaders who complained about that, but nobody decided something has to be done. Mr. Nelson Mandela, who was a lawyer, who had a good job and a good practice, decided, I'm going to surrender my private ambition for the sake of the other people. And I, I'm going to do something about this. He did not wait. And every other leader you think about that you are respectful of probably is the same way, including people like Sir Lyndon Penling and, and Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. and Mother Teresa and... Helen Keller, so many people in that category, they all have the same spirit. I'm not going to wait. Let's do something. My question is, what are you observing in your environment that you are complaining about and doing nothing about it? That means you are not a leader. You are a complainer. The second principle is leaders know character counts. Leaders are very careful to protect their character. And thirdly, leaders have their heads in the clouds. They have a big vision, but they also keep their feet on the ground. They're in touch with the compassion needed of the people who are not where they are. Leaders should always be ahead of people, but never out of sight. Can I say it again? Leaders must be ahead of the people. Don't be with the people. You've got to be ahead of them. But you must not be out of sight. In other words, the people, you know, the people don't know where to go if they can't see you. So you're supposed to be with your head in the clouds with a massive vision, a big dream, all these great ideas, but don't let your feet leave the ground because some people ain't in the clouds. So they are in touch with the infirmities of the people. They come back and teach and train and motivate and help those people. Thirdly, leaders, have their, leaders must be aware of their shared values. Their values are important. They believe that they, the things they value, the people should value and they share their values. Uh, number four, number five, rather, leaders know you cannot do it alone. Leaders are very driven, but they like people in the back seat with them. They know they can't go alone. They always know that they need a team, they need people, they need a group. Leaders do not achieve anything alone. Dictators do. And number six, leaders know the legacy you leave is the life you live. Leaders live by example. They don't live by instructions. Uh, leaders live by living what they say, manifesting what they say. They don't give instruction. They live instructions. So a true leader actually demonstrates what they tell you to do. They live what they give you instruction on. And of course, number seven, leaders know that leadership is everyone's business, that everyone should be involved in leadership. A true leader is always uh, driving other people to become more responsible, to become more independent, to become more of a, uh, of a thinker themselves. So leaders always want people to become leaders. 
Again, those who are not leaders want to make sure you never join their category. They try to keep you out of their space. They, they think the space is only for them. And these are not leaders. These are parasites with titles, of course. All right, that leads me then to the next point. I want to give you an example about qualifications. And there's a reason why I want you to, to see this. You just can't decide I'm going to be a leader. You have to be trained and also have to have some qualifications. And I want to make a reference to the first century leader whose name was Paul. Uh, Paul was trained highly by the, by the University of Gamaliel. He was one of the top students from that school. So Paul was very well educated. And Paul was also a Roman citizen, even though he was a Jew. So he was exposed to a lot of the leadership environment of the pagan world. And Paul began to train leaders to take positions in churches that he built all over Asia Minor. And Paul began to appoint people to take leadership positions, but he knew that they had to be trained. And he laid out in this statement, in his letter to one of his young leaders, whose name is Timothy, Paul says, if you're going to appoint people, here's some qualifications they should have. I want you to read them with me in the book of Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, overseer there means manager or leader, okay? It's not a religious term. If he desires that, he says, that's a, a what? A, a noble time. In other words, if you decide that you want to be a leader, Paul says, that's a good decision. You know, I've heard so many people, especially religious people, you know, you know, I don't really want to be, you know, I don't want to be a French, you know, I just, I just want to sit back. What are you telling me? Paul says, look, desire to be a person of influence. And if you do it, that's a good thing. Paul had the same problems 2,000 years ago than we have today. People who just like to attend church. They don't want to get involved in nothing. They don't want to be about in, 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 you know, responsible for nothing. They don't want to make any difference, any changes in life. They just want to kind of just come and warm a pew and then go back home and watch TV. Paul says, you should have a desire to be a leader. One who oversees something. And then he says, if you desire that, that's a good thing. But now he cautions us. He says, there are some qualifications. Let's read them. He says, now the overseer must be above what? Reproach. We ain't going to deal with these in detail tonight because it's too, too heavy stuff. But I just want to list his qualifications. They must be above what? Reproach. Secondly, the husband of but one wife. Notice Paul didn't even get the power and authority and stuff first. He's dealing with something different first. He's dealing with personal lifestyle. He's dealing with private issues. Because you lead out of your life, not out of your position. Can I say it again? Write it down. You don't lead out of your position. You lead out of your life. And your life could destroy the position. Your life is more important than the position. How many people you know have high position, but their lifestyle destroyed it? So Paul says, before you desire a position, let's deal with you first. Be above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate. Don't let that word slip by, temperate. Temperate means you don't get angry quickly. Let me tell you why Paul said that. When you are in leadership, the people will test you every day, all day, every minute of the day. Matter of fact, Moses lost his leadership through the word temperate. That's how he lost his leadership. Moses lost it. He never went to the promised land because of that word, temperate. You remember Moses? Why did Moses lose his leadership? He became angry at the people. Now, you know, you've been with people for 40 years. You probably, you're supposed to be used to their foolishness. But I think Moses, must he didn't eat well that morning or whatever. You know, maybe his wife didn't do him well. I don't know, but the guy was off. And the Bible says, when the people start complaining and they were crying out to him for water, Moses cursed, the Bible says, and he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. God told Moses to speak to the rock and the water will come out. And Moses said, these stiff necked people, and I can't say other words he said because I don't know what he said, but the Bible says he cursed. Okay? In other words, you all be amazed how many times you tempt a pastor to curse. Not me now, of course, you know, I'm a holy man, but. 
<laughs> You'll be amazed the things that people do that irritates a leader. And Paul says you got to be what? Temperate, self-control. See the next word? Self-control, right next to it. Self-control. Control yourself. People will disappoint you. They will abuse you. They will gossip about you. They'll criticize. Some of the folks who are nearest to you will go back and talk about you at the dinner table and take you apart. I would say just ignore that. Be temperate. Be cool. Some of you have been coming to this place for 30 years. You never saw me angry. Never angry. Why? I was the most short of patience person in my family. My mother used to actually warn me. Your temper is going to get you in prison, she says. You need to get your temper under control. I was one of 11 children. I was the one, she said, who had the hottest temper. I used to get mad and strike out. And she sat me down one day. She says, if you don't get this under control, it will destroy you. And I heard my mother. I must have been about 11 years old when she told me that. She says, son, you need to get your temper under control. See the word temper? Right there, temper, temper. She says, you cannot live like this. You cannot get angry at everything. So I'm very cool. And that has saved me a lot of my lifetime. Just be cool. Because people will always test your peace. Paul says, be respectable. He's talking about leadership and qualifications now. Be what? Respectable. That means make people respect you. One day days, I'm a teacher on respect because some of you don't know what makes, what makes a person respect you. I'll give you one hint. Respect comes from consistency of conscience. That's a deep way. Write it down, man. When a person doesn't change their convictions, you got to respect them. Even if you disagree with them, you got to respect the fact that they are stable and steady and they believe in their convictions. That's what you respect. You can't respect people who keep compromising and changing their minds and agreeing one day and then disagreeing the next day and then agreeing again. These people are not worthy of respect. To be respectful means I have convictions, standards, values I will never sacrifice. Some people don't like me, that's fine, but they gotta respect Miles Monroe because you know the greatest thing people say to me, someone said to me on Sunday, they said, Pastor Miles, I went on YouTube, they might be here and I don't know what it was, and they said, I listened to a tape from you from 1994, and you are still saying the same thing today, they said. They said, that's one thing I like with you, you are consistent. How many leaders in the world today have changed their minds? Can't trust them. Consistency of conscience. Then he says, what's the next one? Hospitable. Hospitable means, he knows, uh, be nice to people. Smile with people. Take time to be with people. Hug people. Bless people. Listen to people. Talk to people. Don't walk past people. Don't pout your mode off. Hospitable. You'll be amazed how many people avoid you because you are so unhospitable. Some of you all think I'm the nicest, guys, the nicest guy in the world. I always got something good to say to you. You see me anywhere? Hey, hi. Why? Leader got to be hospitable, to even his enemies. Because enemies are simply temporary. They're always temporary. Hospitable means I am willing to be always open to you, to serve you. Hospitality. And it might be giving you a smile, or giving you a cup of water, or giving you my time or even my air. Hospitality. Then he says they must be able to what? Teach. This is important. <laughs> he said you can't be a leader unless you are able to effectively communicate your ideas. And that comes through what? Training, practice, reading, studying, preparation, content. Coming to a session like this is very important for you. It makes you a better teacher. You're learning new ideas and you'll be able to explain them more effectively if you understand them yourself. You got to be able to teach. The next one is not given to drunkenness. Uh oh. Paul says, look, if you're going to be a leader, you cannot be a victim of substances. By the way, uh, please put in that sentence drunkenness, getting high, sniffing, shooting up. 
Whatever affects your mental state is considered drunkenness. So don't, don't let anyone tell you that marijuana ain't in the Bible and cocaine ain't in the Bible and my bitches ain't in the Bible. And that, that's foolishness. It's there. That includes sniffing glue. Whatever affects your mental stability is drunkenness. He says you must not be given to drunkenness. A leader must never be disoriented. Why? Because people are depending on your decisions. I never forget reading in the book, the 24th chapter of Proverbs, it says, a king should never drink wine when it moveth in the cup. Let me tell you what he means by that. It means fermentation. The two types of wine, see? The fresh grape juice and then the kind that is fermented. Solomon is a king. Solomon says a king should not drink wine when it moveth in the cup. It's fermenting. He says, least he clouds his judgment and destroy the people. You know, politicians who are alcoholics, they're dangerous. Because they're making decisions for you behind closed doors, and they could be affected mentally by the substance that they are being influenced by. So leaders must not be controlled by any substance. Very important. Then the next one is what? Not violent, but gentle. Lashing out at people. You know, some people you're afraid to talk to because they always seem to be angry or they seem like they're irritated by anger, you, you, you normally avoid those people. The Bible says if you're going to be a leader, you got to be very gentle, you know, open, kind. And some folks got not nice things to say about you, you know, or to you. You got to still be nonviolent. I think Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. showed this beauty of nonviolence. Uh, they were gentle. Next one is what? Not given to quarrelsome Oh boy, that sounds like a Bahamian A. Not quarrelsome. You cannot be a leader if you're always creating arguments, picking fights, quarreling over little things that are not important. Sometimes it's just easier to just be quiet and let the people do what they do and maintain your integrity. You don't get involved in quarrels. Yeah. The next one is what? Not a lover of money. Why Paul put it on the list? Because he had that problem. There are people who go into positions to secure themselves, not to secure the people. They go into positions so that they can become rich, not to enrich the people. Paul says you should never be motivated by money if you're going to be a leader. Because you will sacrifice the people for money. And also sell your integrity for it. The next one he says, it must be one who manages his own family well and see that his children obey him or her with proper respect. You know, my life, I have to live my life a certain way for you all to respect me. So my son and daughter, they are my greatest test of my leadership. And you all know my children. And both of them respect me, and they work with me now, and they are helping me do what I do. I didn't ask them to come and join me. They decided that themselves. This is a part of qualifications for leadership. Now, there are sometimes your children, they don't behave properly. What you got to always remember in your mind is that you did your best with them. You can't make children do certain things. You can't force them. When they have become adults, they got to make their own decisions. But you need to know that I did my best and also I was the example that they needed. If you are good examples to your kids, then they are responsible for their decisions after they are adults. And you must be able to know that publicly and say that publicly. You know, that's my son, and that's not what I taught him. So, you must, they have to respect you, is the point. That's important here. It didn't say they got to love you, you know. Read it. Your kids don't have to love you, but they got to respect you. They would say, boy, you know, I ain't quite into what my daddy doing, but boy, I got to respect him. He into that. He believe in God. You know, so the kid got to respect you. Very important. Then he says that uh, his children must obey him. Now notice the difference between, you know, uh, uh, you know, children and adults. Uh, adults don't obey, but children are supposed to obey. So when they're small, they should obey you. If you're going to be a leader, you got to instill in your children a respect for authority, and you are their first authority. And you must instill that in them. 
Okay. Anyhow, I want to end this by saying, if anyone does not know how to manage his own home family well, how can he take care of God's church? Paul is comparing that. He must not be a recent convert. It's important. That's a whole new teaching. And he may become, or he may become conceited and fall under judgment like the devil did. Now remember how Satan fell. He was one of God's top cherubims. And uh, his position went to his head. He was used to that, couldn't handle that kind of power. And he began to think that he and God was company. You know, they keep company with each other. And God said, wait, excuse me, uh, I created you. You're not in my class. Okay. And of course, it went to his head. And that happens to some people. You know, you, if, if you give them positions too, too early, uh, they claim they can handle it. They can't handle it. And sometimes people wonder why even in this church, where we pastor, where we, 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 we don't put people in a position for a long time. It's because we, we, we be testing things. Your talent doesn't qualify you for leadership. Your gifts don't qualify you for leadership. You got to be what? Tested. Matter of fact, it says in the next statement, he must also have a good reputation with people outside. How are you going to know your reputation if I give you time to find out who what people are saying about you? You know, and sometimes people move around, you know, they move around. People come in, they move around. And you move around too fast, I get nervous. You know, uh, you're in that church, and then that church, the next church, and that church, and all of a sudden this church, and all of a sudden you want to do something. I'm like, excuse me, uh, sit down. Yeah, but you don't know how talented I am. Excuse me, sit down. I got experience, I've been to five different churches. That's why you're sitting down, because you've been to five, <laughs> and I, I want to know why you left. See, the problem is a plant can't grow if you keep rooting it up. When we appoint people, we don't hardly miss. A couple of times you miss. Jesus missed. He missed one. <laughs> and, but you know, Jesus was cool. Jesus says, I know one of y'all is a betrayer wrong. You know, in other words, I, Keep your enemies close so you know where they are all the time. And, you know, that's a, some ideas there. But Paul, look at Paul's statements. Now, let me just summarize uh, Paul's qualifications for you real quick. Number one, he dealt with four qualifications. Matter of fact, five. He dealt with first, spiritual qualifications. Secondly, intellectual qualifications. Thirdly, physical qualifications, taking care of your body. And then number four, emotional qualifications, not becoming angry and bitter and violent. And then... Relational qualifications. You must be in relationship with your family and your, your spouse or your children or your parents or whatever. He dealt with five qualification areas. If you want to become an effective leader, you can look at this list and start working on this list. <laughs> I got an email from someone recently. They might be watching. I don't know if they be watching now. But they said, I had to leave my church because I finally realized uh, that the pastor's wife don't come to the church anymore. <laughs> hey, oh, that's serious. That, that, that's very often. That happens fairly often. You'd be amazed. In other words, the person realized that not even the wife believed in what the pastor is preaching. She, she goes to another church. Why should I stay? Paul says that that person is disqualified. If your own family don't believe what you're saying, why should I? They group with you. You know, you, you, you don't know what a blessing it is for me in this organization, in this ministry, to have my father, all my sisters, and my brothers who have come under this ministry and have been served here for years. You know, that means so much to me. I am their younger brother. They believe what I'm saying. Because they know my life, they see my life, and who knows you better than your own siblings? They know my standards, they know my quality of life, they know my habits, they, they, they grew up with me. I qualify relationally. Do I qualify emotionally? I told you I don't get mad at you all. Do I qualify physically? Look at this guy, man. You know, hey, I'll be 60 next year. I know you don't believe that. No sickness, no disease, ain't been in hospital for 32 years. This is physical health. Why? I don't drink, don't smoke, don't take no drugs, I don't sniff nothing. I eat 
healthy. I drink water. I drink you know, good juices. I take vitamins. Why? Because my body must be healthy, physical. I can't be drunk. Leadership requires this. If you're going to be a leader, you're going to have to qualify in these five areas. Intellectually, well, you could probably tell that I'm always a, a student. I'm always learning. And spiritually, my life is wrapped up in my prayer life with God. This is leadership. And Paul says that person is capable of overseeing anything. And that could be a person or a country. Now, 10 leadership essentials. Number one, you must believe that you are designed to lead. Number two, matter of fact, he said at 12. Number two, you must discover yourself. These are the 12 leadership principles. Number three, you must capture your vision. I'm just giving you statements right now. Each one of these is a whole session I will teach, okay? Number four, you must share your inspiration if you're going to become a leader. Number five, you must commit to principles and values that you will never violate. In other words, you set standards that you will never sacrifice. And number six, you must express your passion to people. Talk about what you are passionate about. Publicly tell people what you want to do, what you want to see change. You got to talk about it. Don't keep your passion silent. Leaders actually talk about what makes them angry. They express their passion. Number seven, leaders empower other people. They don't pursue power, they pursue empowering other people. Number eight, leaders discipline themselves to protect their purpose. Purpose is your reason for living. Leaders live a life of discipline to protect that. In other words, they don't want to cancel their assignment by bad decisions that they make about their lives. They protect their lives by protecting their purpose. They discipline themselves. And uh, number nine, leaders coordinate their resources effectively. They know how to handle material and money and equipment and buildings and, and time. and All these are resources. Leaders coordinate resources. Number 10, leaders manage their priorities. If you're going to become a leader, you've got to develop your priorities now. Priorities are important because they protect you from other people interfering in your lives. Without priorities, you will end up living other people's priorities. If you don't establish what's important to you, I'll give you some things that are important to me. So you've got to know your priorities. You must establish them, and then you must protect them. Manage your life according to them. And then number 11, you must mentor someone greater than yourself. A leader will always live their lives through their successor. They produce people. They don't just produce buildings. They develop people. They don't just develop programs. Leaders leave the world people. They don't leave them some monument. They, they leave the world people. And I always think of Jesus Christ as such an amazing experience because Jesus never built a building, never established a program. He simply built people. And he left us these people, and these people changed the world. My question, who are you mentoring right now to take your place in whatever you're doing? Have you identified a few people that you are going to pour your life into and you're going to turn things over to and you're going to allow them to, to test their skills through your privilege? This is leadership. And number 12, leaders must understand management. Leaders must understand that they have to manage even though they are not managers. Let me explain what I mean by that. All leaders are managers before they are, are leaders. But a leader is, is uh, aware that management is only a small part of what he does. He must understand management. Management has more to do with delegation, delegating responsibility to other people. Leaders share power. They allow people to, to have value around them by giving them responsibility. That's what management is about. So these are the 12 principles essential to leadership development. I will teach each one of these separately. 
you'll be amazed that each one of them is a book in itself. Like number one, to me, is a book. So much to learn about just your design for leadership. And we will deal with that in the coming months, uh, weeks rather. I just want to give you a little bonus here tonight. I want to give you 12 principles of leadership that I have distilled in my books. Number one, purpose. I'm going to give you this statement next to them. Write them down. To become a leader, you must discover your purpose. Purpose is discovering your sense of destiny. You become aware that you were not born just to make a living and breathe oxygen. You dis discover that you were born to give life something else. You were born to do something for humanity. Number two, vision. A leader must have a perception of the future that is respectable and noble. They see a future that's better than the present and they're willing to go to it at any cost. Number three, passion. All leaders must have a commitment beyond their own safety. They must be willing to handle the tests, the opposition, the criticism because of their passion. Passion is the only thing that can stand up against opposition. And passion is, is a desire that is stronger than the threat of death. A person who has passion, you can't threaten them because it's too late. And this is why I define passion as not finding something to live for, but finding something to die for. If you find something that's worth dying for, you've discovered your passion. And that could even be a business idea, you know? You, you have a business idea, you believe in it so much that you actually would refinance your house to go into this idea. That's a passion. Life normally eventually pay that person off. Life will watch you to see how far you will go for your passion. Then life will pay you off. Number four, convictions. Very important one. Leaders must have a deep belief in their rightness. Now what I mean by that is leaders must believe in what they believe is right. And they must never have it for sale. Conviction means I believe in something so deeply that you will not be able to buy me to give it up. This is lacking in leadership all over the world. Very few leaders I see on the horizon have conviction. As a matter of fact, I'm nervous. I look at some of the religious leaders, I see some of the political leaders, some of the corporate leaders, and these leaders, have, they don't have any conviction. No conviction, and this is dangerous. And today, the pressures of life, <laughs> <laughs> you know what they call current affairs? This term current affairs is very dangerous lately. There's a current in our affairs. And if you can't swim with your convictions, you can float down with the current. And so far, a whole lot of folks just floating. The minute you float, you are not a leader. Leaders do not follow the crowd. What makes a person a leader is the fact that they oppose the convention, the conventional things. That's what leaders are made out of, people who defy the context, who say to life, this is not right, and I am not going with this. The pressures that the people are feeling today in leadership is exposing their lack of leadership because they have no conviction. I can hardly find a leader in the world right now, very few, and you know, I think I travel a little bit, and I meet them, and, and you could see, even in my own country, I'm trying to identify, okay, who has conviction? Conviction. The opposite of conviction, write it down, is compromise. You know, I believe that compromise was created for things that are not important. But for things that are important in life, whatever you consider to be important, there's no compromise. This is why people go to jail like Nelson Mandela. His conviction was so strong that he was right. He decided, I'm going to prison for 24 years for this one. How, where are these leaders lately? In other words, leaders don't look for approval or even to be liked. They want to be right. And I'm going to tell you something about life. If you are always on the right side, life will always keep you alive, even after you die. 
Your convictions actually help you live forever. <laughs> Think about the leaders who died, like Mahatma Gandhi. His convictions about the oppression of Indians by the colonial powers of Britain was so deep, he said, I'm going to starve myself to death in prison. And he refused to eat. He was skin and bones when they delivered him. And they actually dismantled colonialism in India, the largest country in the world at that time, because of a skinny little man who was stick and bones who decided, I have a deep conviction. If my people are not free, I'm not eating another morsel of food, and I'm going to die on your hands, and the world will know that you killed me. What a conviction. Are there any politicians around like that? Or are we just making deals on the tables or deals in conference rooms or deals in boardrooms? Are we just making deals? But what about conviction? You young people here tonight, please find something we're dying for, please. Me, I've been criticized all my life in the Bahamas. Criticism actually <laughs> qualifies you for respect. Criticism is normally when people don't like the fact that you have too much deep convictions. People want you to go with them. And when you refuse to go with them, then they become very uncomfortable with you and sometimes lash out at you. But your convictions are your deep belief in what is right. Leaders, secondly, number five, uh, have compassion. Compassion is love for the dignity of humans. All leaders have a deep love for humanity. If you study again, just call the names I called. These people gave themselves for people. <laughs> they, they, they were willing to sacrifice for the dignity of other humans. That's compassion. That's what Jesus did on the cross for humanity. He laid his life down, not for himself. He had compassion on humanity. And he decided, I'm going to set them free if it, if it kills me. And it killed him. Of course, he rose again to check, make sure it happened. Number six, leaders must live by principles. And this will be the focus of our event coming up in November. Um, the principles are the standards that you decide to live by, to function by. Certain things you will not violate. I will not steal. I will not bear false witness. I will not take deals on the table. I will not lie. I will not commit adultery with other people's uh, property. I will not steal. I will not take, um, uh, what do they call it, kickbacks. I will not pad invoices. I will not over invoice a project. In other words, they, these people have standards. A leader has standards. Where are the leaders? And number seven, leaders have values. Values are what we call codes of ethics. And ethical, it's, it's, it's like a personal contract with yourself about what is important to you. Code of ethic. Number eight, leaders must have a clear plan. Always a clear plan. Always be a planner. A leader got to have a plan all the time. Have a plan that they're working on in their lives. Their life is planned. Uh, this is important because leaders are not people who are looking for a current to take them somewhere. They already got their GSP all worked out. <laughs> they got the destination clocked in. They, they, they put the coordinates in their lives in to life. They know exactly where they're going. They, uh, how they say it in, in, in aviation, they, they got their flight plan already logged in. So when the hurricanes come and the storms come and the lightning flashes and the thunder comes and the rain comes, they know that's okay. I'm going to bump around a little bit, but I got my coordinates in. They have a plan. Leaders are not afraid of set setbacks and side tracks. All they know is that they have a main track. They're going to stay on track. They may even fall and get up, but they're going to get back on track. Leaders have a one-track mind. Yes? Number nine, persistence. Big one. Leaders are committed to success. And that word commitment is important here. Persistence is insisting 
on what you desire. Persistence means I insist on getting what I dream. I insist on it, which means that life is going to have to let this go. Life could hold this as long as it wants. I'm going to get this. Persistence means bearing up under pressure. It is the foundation of courage. It is, it is the very thing that gives the leader stickability. Persistence means that I believe in the future so much that the present have to let me go. This is persistence. And by the way, those who are watching me online, you can put that quote right there and send it out. Persistence is when you tell the present, the future is more important than you. I'm going there. That's what leaders are. They don't, leaders, they don't live in the, in the present. They live in the future. Their body's in the present. They believe in the hope more than they believe in the environment that they are in. Leaders have this powerful persistence. And number 10 is dedication. Uh, I'm going to write a book on this one someday, but the dedication is so, more, so important. I discovered that dedication is more important than loyalty, faithfulness, and commitment. And someday I'll explain that. But dedication is the highest form of relationship. Dedication. Uh, you can be loyal and not be dedicated. <laughs> I could be loyal to you for the wrong reason. That's what I'm saying. In other words, I could show up every single day. Loyal to you. Why? Because I want your job. <laughs> it ain't you and love. Faithfulness is also not as important as dedication. You can be faithful to something for the wrong reason. That's why marriages don't work. Marriages don't work because people marry people who are faithful and committed and loyal. Let me tell you something. Your marriage is not safe if the person who loves you is committed. But they can be committed to you, come home every day, but still got a sweetheart. So they are committed to coming home every night. But where they being before that is the question. See, so the commitment is, 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 is not, doesn't mean that you're safe. And the loyalty, they can be coming home every day. They come home every day. That's loyal. I got a loyal husband, loyal wife. They always come home. Yeah, but where they been on the way there? So the loyalty doesn't mean that you are safe either. Am I coming home? See, dedication is a different story. Dedication means I live on you. I exist on you. If you fail, I fail. If you survive, I survive. I live for you only as dedication. Leaders must be dedicated to the task. You know, <laughs> there's some folks who are loyal to you until pressure comes. Come on, talk to me, leaders. They, they with you. Yeah, I'm with you, brother. How many people left Martin Luther King when them dogs and them hoses showed up? They gone. This man crazy. A lot of people left them. Why? They weren't willing to be bitten with dogs and thrown into prison in Alabama. They said, look, we, we'll march with you, but we ain't going that far. So we're loyal and we're faithful and committed to a point. But the man who decided to go to jail with him, like Andrew Young, was dedicated. Dedication means if you go, I go. If they kill you, I am dead. That's what marriage should be built on. How dedicated are you to your vision? Are you willing to take all the criticism, all the abuse? It's leadership. What they say? Take a licking, keep on ticking. That's what leaders do. They take a good licking, and then they get up and keep on ticking. That's what leadership is about. I hope this has been helpful for you tonight. And number seven, number 11, sacrifice. If you're going to be a successful leader, you're going to have to be willing to be a sacrifice. You must be willing to suffer for the cause of your vision, what you want to do. And finally, number 12, and this is an important one, a leader must be accountable. You're not 
uh, authority unto yourself. You are accountable to someone else. Leaders are always submitted to a higher authority. First of all, it must be a person or persons on earth. Don't tell me you're submitted to God. <laughs> Leaders have a human accountability. There are people that they look to for covering and to be accountable to. Never trust a person who is not accountable to someone else. Never trust a person who cannot be rebuked by someone else. Never trust a person who cannot be corrected by someone else. And I tell you, as you study the leaders in the world, the ones who fell are the ones who were not accountable. And you study them, you will find out that's true. That, that, that last one is important. Uh, there must be someone who can correct, rebuke, instruct, and fire the leader. Everyone needs a covering. There are people in my life, as you all know them, I'm accountable to them. And they have a right to call anyone in this church and ask you how I'm doing. They can call my wife and ask her, how's your husband doing? They can call my son and daughter any day and say, tell me, how's your father doing? What's he doing? That's accountability. Don't you ever take the spirit that says the buck stops with me. Of course, the final point is you are accountable to God. If we don't get you, God going to get you. There are many people who died without human accountability, and they can stand before the throne of God, and God going to say, how did you do? What did you do? He will be the ultimate source of authority. So we live with an awareness that we got to give two accounts, to the human authority and to the divine authority. And these will keep a leader humble and fearful. A leader without fear in his life or her life is a dangerous leader. Never trust a leader who is not afraid. The first qualification God gives in the Bible for leadership, the first qualification is they must fear God. And there's a reason why God said that. Because if you don't fear God, I'm in trouble. No conscience. That's why you could kill humans. You could abuse humans. You could oppress humans because you don't fear God. But if you fear God, you will always respect His image. And friends, our time is up. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Dr. Miles Monroe on Leading Edge Leadership with Dr. Monroe, where we discover the leadership within you and also the leadership in others. I trust that you were inspired today and motivated to begin to believe that you can achieve greatness. You were born to be a leader, but you must not die a follower. And I am convinced that every human being was born with a gift that not supposed to just make a living, but to make a difference. So I trust that you will continue to tune in on every segment. Remember, these programs are designed to develop leadership in you and in others around you. Until next time, thanks for joining us. And remember, of course, that you can get a copy of this session on CD or DVD or MP3. And you can also get our books that are available for you in every segment. Each book was written to help you discover your leadership potential. The first book I want to recommend Men is called The Power of Vision. The second book is called The Spirit of Leadership. The third book is called Becoming a Leader. Anyone can do it. And the fourth book is one of my most important books, The Burden of Freedom. You can get all of these books in your hand to study and to read, or you can get the CDs and DVDs of every session to begin to motivate and cultivate your hidden leadership potential. Thanks again for joining us on Leading Edge Leadership. See you here right here next time as we discover the leader in you. This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Miles Monroe International.